So we've been doing a lot of research on this for this presentation. Me and some people in my office have been really working for quite some time on it since Naveen uh, invited us <laughs> to talk about that as well. And so we've been reading a lot of scientific papers, um, trying to put together a story that we also got aware of during the whole process. Um, what I want to share with you is, is the natural heritage as a component for planning and design. So this is the view of the Dehradun in some way. And if you look at Dehradun Valley, it's, it's surrounded on, on all the sides by the mountains. The valley is only about 25 kilometers average in width. It's about 70 meters, you know, in length from point where the Yamuna is and to the point where the Ganges is. So this is one of the only valleys in the country, I think, where the river Yamuna and Ganga come so close together. Till it goes and meets Alaba. So I think this is something that we must really celebrate about their other. And then the distance between the two rivers, the Song and the Tong, Tong's River, is only about 25 kilometers. So between, and then in between you have Bengal and Vizpana. So that to me is the real valley, is the whole valley between Yamuna and Ganga, is what is actually to me the Dune on two sides, uh, surrounded by these two important, we'll come to that, two important <coughs> earthquake zones and thrusts. I don't think we are all aware about that. So on the, on the north of Daradun, you have the MBT thrust, which is the tectonic plate. And the south also you see this. On the south you see this range. This is again a tectonic plate. So this has happened because of the tectonic movement of the Himalayas, the landmass coming and hitting the, uh, the mountain ranges in the Himalayas over there. That's the reason how they come into first place. And then in between you find these dissected hills, which you see over here, 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 which are the isolated hills. <coughs> uh, and you see some of, the, this is the dissected hill, and these are the isolated hills. And if you look at any of the cross section of the mountains, you will understand it is really a very, very, very fragile ecology on which we are sitting. You are basically sitting on moraine, you are just sitting on sand and boulders. That's the ecology on which all the buildings and everything in this region is, is happening. And these are the dissected hills dissected because the mountain streams run very fast, they come very fast down and they erode the mountains which are just sand and gravelly. And you have the isolated and this fan shape where all the alluvium is deposited from these lower, lesser Himalayas onto the plains and the Shivalik. And this is how this whole plain is, this whole range is found here. Now, if you look at the proximal fans or the aluminum fans, you will begin to see this kind of a construction of the soil over here, which is nothing but rock, boulders which move out, terraces that you see when you fly in. And if you look at the structure of the soil, which you open the window and you'll find the same set of mountains, it is nothing but simple gravel. But you'll be astonished to understand that they are at least, it says 3.53 kA, which is kilo annum, which is minimum 4,20,000 years old structure on which you are sitting, multiplied by X number of times. So that is the geology, which in one way is the basis of this whole valley of Dune. And I'll explain to you why I'm emphasizing on this so much a little later. And if you take the cross section of the whole valley from Mohan to the lesser Himalayas, what you will find is, is the soil gets dumped into this area and it has taken more than 16 lakh years 
in different stages to have been deposited over the Shivaliks in this area. So Dehradun sits on dune gravels deposited over about 16 lakh years before time. And this is the whole period of formation of the MBT thr thrust. I'll not go too much into this, it's a bit technical, but you must also understand this is what I'm talking about from this point in the Yamuna to the Ganges is a length of about 70 kilometers. And, and this part of the valley is about 25 kilometers wide. And between Song and the Tom's River connected. That's what forms this undulation. That's Masudi and that's Dehradun, the relative heights. It's averaging 450 meters above sea level. And different geographies that happen in the process. So we put together in our office a map uh, from the Google Earth which shows both the Song and the Tonsa River. Then we overlaid on it the master plan boundaries with nine zonal regions on that. Then we overlaid the municipal boundary of Dehradun, which is what you see over here. So these are the three things that we overlaid. The zonal map as well as the master plan doesn't take into account the geography, nor does it talk about Yamuna, nor does it talk about Ganges nor does it talk about the natural heritage, geology or anything. Like any other master plan or zonal plan, there are no maps in it. It's primarily about population and land use, not about natural resources. And then we put in this, the red line that you see is the smart city area, which is proposed over for the development of and we've got some important landmarks, as you can see. What's critical here is to understand the geology and where you stand in terms of the Aradun. This is the main boundary thrust. It's very critical because the landmarks hits the lesser Himalayas and there is a tectonic plate gap over there. And it's an active plate, which means the earthquake can happen any time. And that's the place where it is going to get impacted most. This is the other range and the other Santogar uh, plate also runs through almost literally through the middle of Dehradun, which is not so active at the moment. And in terms of larger geographies, you can see how this plate runs almost through the entire Himalayas, which is what I'm going to show you now. So this is the MBT, main boundary thrust. Same MBT, main boundary thrust, runs through Dehradun, to Shimla, to Kangra, to Jammu, and it goes into Pakistan. This is one of the most fragile, and any movement along any of these areas, or this area, will have a direct impact onto the geography of this place. And it has already happened, and I'll show you what impact it happened. This is the 1905 earthquake that happened in Kangra, which is one of the worst recorded earthquakes in India. At that point of time, in 1905, imagine what might have been the population of Kangra, Mithilajan, and Dhamshala, out of which 20,000 people died. Now, 10.8 on the Richter scale. And Dehradun was also severely impacted in 1905 because of the seismic uh, vibrations in, because being in the same place. So when you have an earthquake of that, everything comes down. You need huge spaces even for your survival post-earthquake. World over, there are guidelines how to build in seismic zone. And isolated footing is one of the things that has been adapted. The image on the right is an airport I just came back from, which is one of the largest airport and all hospitals and airports in Turkey have isolated footing. So does this Sabira Gokchen Airport on Sahara. This is how people across the world are trying to be prepared for earthquakes. I don't see it anywhere in Dehradun. 
and what do municipalities do to prepare for the big one. Living in San Francisco, most of us would keep a bottle of water, first aid, all of those things below the bed, including torch, everything, as part of being prepared for an earthquake. So if it hasn't happened, doesn't mean that it is not going to happen. So that's part of the geology and the soils. I'll talk a little bit more about the soils a little later. And this is the story of, of the Goon waters. This is the Song River. And this is how beautiful and clean it looks. Probably two and a half kilometers as a crow flies. The watershed of the rivers, both Yamna and Ganga, literally have been cut half and half. And I presume the Rajpur Rook is the ridge, I think, so I need to verify a bit more, which separates the two in two different watersheds. I have a feeling that's it. And it definitely separates Bindal and Rispana. And it also then separates Tons and Song, and definitely it separates them Yamna and Ganga. And it's very easily understood that they always built on the ridge, never in the valley. So Rajput must be, and I, I have a geological understanding why, why did they build in Dera 350 years back? Because it is the, I'll show you, prove you, prove now, that it is the oldest alluvium deposit in this region. And that's why it is the most stable. And it is the furthermost from Masuri. And, that, and so the, the youngest alluvium deposits are where you are sitting here. And the oldest alluvium deposits are at Dera. So that is why Dera is more stable than this part of the valley where we are sitting right now. So that's why when, when the, they resettled over here during the 350 years, and they, the movement system from Teri to Niyawala to uh, old uh, Raipur was the movement into Masuri and when that movement system changed and came on to uh, <clears throat> this part of Dehradun, then they looked at the most stable place and geologically the, uh, the Chanda area is the most stable part of Dehradun today. And this whole development in this area is only 10-12 years old along this especially the diversion area and post Marsi. And this is what it looks like when we pulled out the geological maps and reinterpreted them. And you will see this is Dehradun and you will see that this is one of the, the dark pink is the, the older alluvium areas and you see all these yellows. These are the newer alluvium areas in which most of the institutional buildings are happening in zone five. And zone 5 of the master plan happens to be in these areas. This is the hydrology mapping that we have done and put into places. It's very easy to now understand why and what settlement and why you find X amount of water in some places in Dehradun and Y amount of water very easily because as you move away, the porosity and the slope, you get large, large chunks of water over here. And because of the uh, gravelly this, uh, there's a huge amount of water deposition here, lesser near the hills, so the runoff is much faster in these areas. So you can see the dark blue is the amount of billion gallons of water which is available in these areas. The water is also saturated, and I'll come to some other issues a little later. That's how we treat the rivers in our country. So this is Sahasadhara. The way it is designed doesn't look better than a slum, but the water is much cleaner. This is, these are the Hassan Baraj at Ponta Sahib. And you can see the quality of water in different places. But when it goes to an urban area, that's how we treat our rivers. What is interesting to understand is that managing storm water is no more an engineering aspect. World over it has changed. World over managing stormwater has changed from piped, underground, sealed uh, of throwing water as soon as possible into the river into a more landscape engineering system of place making and creating 
managing water ecologically. So if you have water channels from your buildings, they come into vegetated landscapes, even in urban areas. In areas, brown fields, it's piped and taken back into vegetated landscape areas, which then become integrated public space and place making. If they have to go through this mobility corridor, it might go below, but even in the mobility corridor, it's picked up into the median, into the landscape. And so there is a there's a new phenomena which is happening, and we have been doing that in this country for quite some time now. So this is the Sahibi River, which has now become what's called a supplementary drain, black in color in Delhi. And these are all the green spaces that we have mapped. And there was this proposal of taking and cleaning in these green spaces and putting it back into before it goes into Yamuna. These were the different ways in which the remedial measures were being done, were proposed to be done. And ecological measures for treating the water and placemaking. This is for Delhi. It can be done very easily. It's been done world over. We come back to Dehradun. And if you look at the elevation and topography, this is the north part, this is the southern part. Clock tower is somewhere here. These are the slopes as it moves down. This is an another imagery which captures from the movement of water from the brown to the blue. Then we map where are the junctions in which water accumulates and which is the direction in which it flows in Dehradun. And then this is a study which has been done for four years. And it concludes which are the potential areas where water logging is happening and which are the areas which are prone to flood in Dehradun. And you can see it's primarily in the southern region. Southeast and southwest, here the runoff is very high in this part. Which is why you also saw the water accumulation happening in the southern parts. And so when there is a flood, this is what happens. And floods in Srinagar can happen anytime, again, anytime. I've predicted it, almost happened last year. And crows and crows of people lose their livelihood. And you know, people like us somehow get over it. But there's a cross section of people below the poverty level who never come back. They don't have insurance, they don't have livelihoods, their houses are maroon, everything they have is kind of maroon. Uh, this is what the essential services, the hospitals looked like during the during the floods in Kashmir. This is what the museum looked like and the manuscript. And this is this explains when the flood happens, what is the situation. So it's not as if the floods will not happen. The floods do not come with a warning. One cloud burst is enough to submerge entire Dehradun. Or five days of a hundred mm rainfall is enough to submerge entire Dehradun because we have choked all the arteries the system of the Ardun completely. So they become narrower, 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 A. The runoff has increased because of paving. Built up has increased. And the classic example of a disastrous way of handling that situation is the Rajpur road where they have paved on either side. So one has to prepare for the for the doomsday scenario and that's what that's what how good we are at it. So you can really see where where it will flood typically. And I missed my flight last time when it was raining here because all the streets near ISBT became rivers. All we were doing is trying to bypass one. So there is traffic jam. The, the water is above the, the engine almost the, at least one and a half foot above flowing on the road. And people say, Pani ha rukta nahi hai, bahut jaldi bhai jata hai. So that is no excuse for, you know, being dysfunctional. But it's not about Pani rukta nahi, you're lucky, aaj Pani nahi rukta hai, kal Pani rukne lag jai hai. Two years, three years back, I was invited to Trishur in Kerala. And I told an urban designer of repute over there, that there's possibility of 
having a flood here where where they completely refused ki yahan to samudra hai pani bahut jaldi nikal jayega and this last this day you saw what happened in, in, in kerala because they have choked all the arteries all the arteries in the arabuna literally choked and so what do these parties do to prepare for them themselves for these kinds of situation this knowledge we don't even talk about floods and possibilities do we have any system for monitoring that no do we have any prepared system for dissemination and communication during the flood no any any response capabilities none so we are not prepared for any kind of landslide or flood now i'm going to tell you why there will be flood over here or what will happen if there is going to be an earthquake if you saw the geology which is very moraine very sandy as soon as there is going to be heavy rainfall there will be landslides so this area closer to the masuri there will be many landslides and the roads will be completely blocked over here and if there is an earthquake huge landslides is part of beyond beyond diversion would be isolated from the rest of the city simply because there will be no movement happening roads will collapse if the bridge will collapse all the landslides will not allow in so in such scenarios there is no water supply available for these places threat of fire no communication no food services available for this part of the town and there is no aerodrome available no emergency large open spaces where to move people or no fire tender availability and so we are not prepared at all that's the scenario in which we are going and this is typically the scenario in delhi every time it rains i don't step out i don't drive for next four hours i don't take any car i might take metro if i need to step out and this is what metro does look at this one it throws all the water from the concourse from the station straight on the street and if somebody has this problem their job is just to make their metro run efficiently urban design if somebody has this problem and whose child it is i don't know so we were given to design this 11 metro stations this is the nehru enclave and this is the kalpani we were asked to do the last mile connectivity improvement and the multimodal transport integration for these eleven stations the two agencies were dda utpac were running on different pace metro wanted to finish asap dda was still grappling with it so while we gave all the concept drawings many of them were not incorporated they might get incorporated little later hopefully so these are the kind of drawings that were provided by dmrc and that's the level of urban response to the context so we did surveys online to find out what do the people of delhi want maximum shaded walk and better safety through night seat lighting so we looked at ways of integrating infrastructure of the city managing storm water that is coming down from these places which are which are changed but they have not been integrated to the city systems and different ways of integrating the runoff and the increased runoff different ways of integrating that in the open space that we were then redesigning it bringing once you have a metro corridor the birds are gone many of the birds can't fly away because they are short hopping distances so we are proposing not the plastic ways of getting the plants back onto the but different ways in which you can bring bird life as well as traffic coming and lighting up and we saw people in india will no matter if you lower the curb stone they will the bikes will go over it cars will jump over it so we devised a different kind of system of yet having a curb height and still being able to manage some water in your indians and four of these these have been taken up by the dwarka now and is being taken up in palam now so integrating open space integrating infrastructure integrating a problem looking at green open space within the city as a way of solving the problem and place making is what every city needs including dehradun so this is for palam which we done with the uh, center for green mobility and utp for every project no matter what scale it is this is 2500 acre township 
integrating green and water and movement as a layer of mobility, as a layer for green infrastructure, as a layer for recreation, as a layer for problem solving, that's what we're trying to do. So to connect the different water network, slow down the movement of water, that's what you need in the Amazon very, very badly. This is Devanya in, in Bhutan. Keep off the water channel so you will see all the blues and none of the buildings happen in the blues. If we have blocked any Nala, as in this case in Bangalore, we reconnect them. And that's what it looks like. And these are the many different ways in which we have slowed down the water, reconnected, detained it, retained it in different scenarios across the country and some in other parts of the world. So there are those first thing if you want to do anything is to remap its drainage system. No city in India has a drainage uh, mapping uh, anywhere in the country. So even if we're doing a small heritage site, the way the water is going to move and we see over in this part, this is how we manage the use of storm water. Even, even in a redesign in the heritage site. This is Dehradun and what is its story like and why this chaos has happened. So if we looked at um, GIS mapping from 1972 to 2016 and you can see the increase in the red color. The increase in the red color is very obvious at the cost of the green color. This is 86 to 2011. And what is this green color? This is what it is. I just took this photograph just now. It comes at the cost of transformation from the agrarian to built. And transformation from the agrarian to built in an unplanned manner. So what is the repercussion of this? The lowest and the weakest in the society, which is about 28 crore Indians who do not get two meals, will not get even one meal. That is the repercussion because food will become so expensive, they will not be able to have it for themselves. And where is this change happening in Dehradun? This change is primarily happening, as I said, the red is increasing. And this is the one which says the changes. So the light color says no changes. The red is the change. Change conversion of the green into the red, red of course is a bit. So these areas, this is what the green was, white, and this has been taken over by habitation, which you just saw, the images. And these are some other parts in the north and in the west of municipal boundaries of now, if we look at one small core area, uh, this is the Ghantagar, and this area is, is the situation in that area, which is the red, is, as you can see, is essentially commercial. This is the center. This is where the green began to me. And what you see over here is when you compare these two slides, uh, this is the green space that you get. According to the world WHO standards, nine square meter per person is mandatory. And if, and you should have access to open space within 300 meters, about 0.25 to one hectare of open space should be available to any urbanite is not available in these areas at all. So now if you compare a green space matrix to a density, population density map, so where it is most dense, there is least amount of green space available. Where it is most dense, there is least amount of green space available. Where it is least dense, there is maximum amount of green space available. So there is a, there's a, there's a big inequality And then the maximum amount of cultural events or cultural items or cultural heritage or whatever you want to say 
is happening in areas of these three areas in the room, in this part of the room. So what do we do? We'll tell you an example. This is Khilki in Delhi, which we've taken up as part of an international design competition, which we won as Living Cities Design Competition, which has got similar character in terms of density. Sheikh Sarah in Khilki, and you will see how dense it is, how it is clean it is. As part of this competition, we try to say how to reclaim the greens in the city by connecting these open spaces, by using that as infra green infrastructure, regaining back the food production in open spaces and creating ecologies. And we realized we were able to get at least two to three percent more green back into these spaces. So that's, that is what we had done and possibly to do it and we thought of scaling it up. And here is an example of scaling it up in Delhi, which is going to be now becoming part of the master plan that's being considered for the new master plan for Delhi by NIUA. So we looked at possibilities of connecting green spaces throughout the whole city of Delhi. This is the Thurman Corridor. You can see from, from Hindal in Uttar Pradesh to Yamuna Bank through these linear green corridors in Delhi. And in the northwest, if you connected these green open spaces and water systems, you could rejuvenate this both the water system as well as green infrastructure because you can't do infrastructure the way it was done traditionally. You don't have money for it at all. 70% of the country doesn't have waste water treatment. When you do this, you have these kinds of uh, obstructions or that come into place and different typologies which we mapped and these were some of the solutions for these typologies. Pedestrian bridges, how to use open space below, bicycling, and if you have, Dehradun doesn't have a solid waste management strategy at the moment, it's dumped in many places. Soon your landfill site will come up and how do you manage a landfill? And there's a leaching of landfill because it will not be sealed properly. It is going to be leached into Bindal and into Rispana and into the Ganges and into the Yamuna, into the towns and so on. So that will be the unfortunate story. Uh, but if you did properly, then you can make it into a regional park system. This is an example of a project in the inner city of Jodhpur, which by this, because we did this project, around this is the Bauli, which is this Bauli which has been cleaned up and this entire neighborhood is now having a different kind of life. It is reactivated. There are many cafes that have come, Buddha and many, many other stores have come up in this. So this whole place has now become transformed completely in a matter of seven years. And uh, every project that we do, this is what it looked like. This is what it looks like. This is what it looked like before we started. And this is how we integrated water conservation strategies into the design aspects. Half of it is paved, half of it is soft so that water sinks within in, in, this, in this area itself. And all of this is possible to do in that Jandia area, in Belakand area, and in any other place in the city. And return of the wildlife in this 1.34 acre property in, in uh, Jodhpur. And more than 100 sparrows come in and you can already see nesting happening. And the turn of the bee in itself is a significant indicator. This is in BLF where the neighbors did not allow. And you can see wilderness brought onto the vacant lot. It's not even a vacant lot. It's just the, uh, the, the setback that you live on. So he had an RV, so the kind of paving that we proposed was a porous concrete glass paver. Any project that we do, we integrate services so that all the water then seeps into minimal amount of paved, only as much as, as is required. Half of the paving surface can go away in most of the cities. Once again, I'm recapitulating uh, the nine zones of Dehradun with the municipal boundary. We put together, there was no comprehensive land use map available for 
because GIA is space for Dehradun, so we picked up from each of these nine zones and made one map on which we overlaid the municipal boundary. And this is the one which so shows the municipal boundary and the nine zones, and this area is the most prone to earthquake. Northern part of Dehradun closer, this is the diversion. This is the old Rajpur road area. The southern area is completely prone. This area is prone because it's young alluvium. This area is prone because of the porosity in the soil and of this area. And it's a huge amount of water. So liquefaction will happen very fast over here. The study has been generated uh, over a period of time as a part of MSC project for Kambali. And this is a flood simulation scenario which has been generated again. The areas that are prone to earthquake, the southern part, is also prone to flooding in the Arizon. The areas that are prone to earthquake have got a huge amount of discharge. So you can imagine what is going to be the scenario in any of these eventualities. A study which was done and which again highlights this aspect is prone to very high prone to earthquake, to landslide. To urban floods, which happen every single year in Jarzun. This is done by Janagra, and we work for them very closely. And these are the indices under which they look at different cities uh, in India. They did a survey of 23 cities under the urban planning and design, urban capacities and resources, transparency and accountability of the administration, and the political representation. And guess what the Arizona scored on 23? It was 22nd, 21st, number 21 out of the 23. So we are at the bottom most. So over the last, I would say, very active 10 years uh, and different advisory capacities and different roles with the government, I have concluded that we cannot wait because the tenure of the political administration where the chief minister is five years, if he's lucky, or she is lucky. The first year is, they're just grappling with it. Second year, they begin to understand a bit, and that's when the secretaries listen to them. After third year, they have to prove very quickly. And the fourth year, they begin to go back into election mode. And then typically in India, very few states have what same government comes back. Now it's been happening in Madhya Pradesh. So this is the kind of scenario that happens.